something started to grunt at us. And it was like, oh, 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 oh. And we immediately all just looked at each other like, what the F is that? I've had encounters where I've been roared at. We're in the woods five minutes and you're, it's like someone roared at you through a megaphone. I was instantly wide awake and I heard this series of whooping sounds really loud and I could, I sat up in bed. It was like a instant, like I, I, like a fear reaction and I was immediately wide awake. And this animal was on all fours, but it moved effortlessly and it was at about this angle. So I'm seeing hind quarters, but I can still see the movement. And uh, they started playing and I heard them play the sound, but they were just supposed to play it once. A guy came down that was up on the hill sitting in a truck and he was scared to death. He said, have you heard that stuff that's going on? I said, what? He said, haven't you heard the thing screaming back from the swamp? And I said, oh my God, they weren't playing it twice. That was them playing it once on the hill and that was something calling back from the swamp. It has been a dream of mine since I was a child to go out in the woods and search for everyone's favorite hairy lumbering biped known as Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Grassman, Woodbooger, Wildman, Bookwas, or in this case, the Falk Monster. I don't know where this desire came from. Was it the countless hours spent watching Bigfoot shows on television as a kid? Was it my travels as a teenager into the heart of the West Coast Sasquatch country? Or was it the nickname Wild Man I was given by my grandfather that somehow foreshadowed my obsessions with this mythical giant? Likely a combination of the three. Through some half-drunken prodding and incessant curiosity, I was granted a unique opportunity to join a friend at the Falk Monster Festival and to inject myself into the Sasquatch High Society, and I didn't hesitate to start asking some questions. This is my inaugural journey into the wild and weird world of Bigfoot culture, and what more fitting place to start than the legendary Boggy Creek. I'll tell you, what I like about Bigfoot stuff is it takes you back to being a kid. So you're a kid, and you go outside in the woods, you're playing in mud puddles, you're getting dirty, and you're fantasizing the monsters, where, as with the Bigfoot stuff, you're 40 years old, blowing whole paychecks, running around the country in mud and rocks and stuff, and going, at the end of the day, I wasted a lot of money, but boy, that sure was fun. You go out in the woods at night, every sound is amplified, it's scary, every tree. When you realize that there could be something in there stalking you, it takes it to a whole nother level. You have rocks thrown at you, sticks thrown at you. Um, you're running for your life. It brings back that childhood, but you're actually in the monster movie. And so I think, to me, it's the, it's the whole experience. After sitting through the Falk Monster Festival for the morning, the crew and I hit the back roads to search out some places that we wanted to target for the evening squatching events. After hours of scouting, we settled on the Sulphur River Bottoms. We're on this road dirt road in the middle of nowhere. It is so freaking loud out here with frogs and bugs. And it is creepy as hell. Looks like a tunnel of trees. We literally just pulled off to the side of the road because there's a cotton mouth in the middle of the road. So this is no joke. <laughs> Man, this place is creepy. There's a ton of coyotes. It's really freaking creepy out here.
creepy out here. Mm -hmm. You think he heard something back? It was a vocal of some kind. I couldn't tell what it was, but it responded to the hit. We're down here at the Sulphur River bottom, which feeds into the Boggy Creek. And uh, it's creepy, man. It's real dark. He's, uh, I'm assuming they're frogs. Bugs is like a constant drone in the background. And this is like an iconic Bigfoot area. Uh, my, my pals out here have been doing some calls. Haven't heard anything. Uh, we were up the road a little bit here earlier. Heard something off in the distance after a call, but kind of inconclusive. Uh, might've been a dog, might've been a coyote, uh, but it's, it's so still and creepy out here. And just, I don't know if it's knowing that this is like where classic Bigfoot, you know, swamp land history was made or it's just the mythology of Bigfoot that creeps into your mind when you're out here in the middle of the night in the dark. But uh, either way, it's such an awesome experience. And Perhaps my most compelling encounter with what I believe to be a Sasquatch occurred with uh, Chester and his dad and uh, another guy named Patrick uh, on August 18th, 2003. We were at Cottonwood Lake up in North Texas. We'd heard there were Bigfoot sightings in the area. So we were kind of there just kind of feeling it out. And right after the sun went down, and I've got this on videotape because I was the AV guy on this particular expedition, something started to grunt at us. And it was like, oh, 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 oh. And we immediately all just looked at each other like, what the F is that? You know, I mean, we're all pretty much like growing up in the outdoors of Texas heard pretty much every weird animal vocalization you could imagine. And this was, it sounded like an ape. I mean, this was like a primate sound, like a howler monkey or something, but it was really loud and powerful. You know, we couldn't see this thing. So we went up on a, uh, there was like a levee overlooking the lake and we had a spotlight and we did see some eye shine. It was kind of yellowish green. They looked pretty high off the ground. We're like, well, that's the right spot. And, uh, you know, we watched that for a while. We made camp right there. So, I mean, for all of you Bigfoot investigators out there, you know, this is your job. You heard a Bigfoot set up camp right there. That's basically the message of that story because that's, that's where the work needs to be done. And throughout the course of the night, there was some other weird stuff. We heard these moans coming across the lake, kind of like howling noises. And the very next morning, when we finally got daylight, we were able to cut our way into this heavy brush and there was a beach on the lake and there were some deep human-like footprints in the sand and there were a bunch of turtle, good-sized turtle shells that had been ripped in half from top to bottom and like just scattered there. And I'm, I can't think of any other explanation as to what could rip a turtle in half. I can't believe how dark it is out here. The, the bugs and the frogs out here just sound like a constant drone. It's creepy in and of itself. Right now I'm looking through uh, this thermal camera and uh, looking down on the river, up into the trees and stuff and knowing damn well the power of suggestion is at play. Just heard something jump into the water and almost shit my pants. And it's just pitch black and creepy. Could be an alligator right in the water right here, I have no idea. <laughs> Did I mention we don't have those in Ohio? If you wanna let out a call, that's up to you.
I think that's a wrap for the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Many years ago, there was a coon hunter that was in uh, the bottomlands, and he was by himself with his coon dog, and they were resting, and they heard this sound, and an animal approached, and from his headlamp, he saw this huge hairy animal, and it reached down, and it threw water, reached down into the swamp water, and threw water up on him, and hissed at him like a cat, scared the heck out of him and his dog, and they took off. So they sent the uh, group that I was with a report about it. In a couple of months, we met them here in Falk, Arkansas. And they said, we'll take you out there where it occurred, but we're not gonna stay long. He said, it scared me so bad, I sold my coon dogs. He said, I was a pro not a professional coon hunter, but that was my main hobby. And I had expensive coon dogs and I sold them. And he said, I don't even go in the woods anymore after this. So. We went way out on this dirt road and uh, we stopped and uh, it's kind of a hill. And he said, down in there in those bottoms is where I saw it. And I'm not getting off the road. And if you guys want to spend the night, that's fine. But before the sun goes down, I'm leaving. Well, that night we got set up about three o'clock in the morning and my buddy set up a call blaster and those familiar with Bigfoot know that you can make Bigfoot supposed vocalization sounds with an amplifier and a speaker and possibly get a, get a reply. So they were up on this hill and I was down in this boat ramp sitting by myself, hopefully, you know, able to catch something in between. And uh, they started playing and I heard them play the sound, but they were just supposed to play it once. But they started playing it twice. And I thought, what the heck are they doing? So we did it like every hour. Or so, you know, till about four or five in the morning. And a, a guy came down that was up on the hill sitting in a truck and he was scared to death. He said, have you heard that stuff that's going on? I said, what? He said, haven't you heard the thing screaming back from the swamp? And I said, oh my God, they weren't playing it twice. That was them playing it once on the hill and that was something calling back from the swamp. And he said, I, I'm staying down here with you. He said, I was sitting up in a trunk and there's a swamp around the truck. He said this thing was splashing around in the swamp, breaking branches and growling and stuff. And it circled me a couple of times and it got up on the road and got a rock and it threw it at the truck and hit the tire. And he said, I'm not going back up there. I said, come on, man, let's go. And, and so that was my first encounter with the Falk monster because it was down in the Mercer Bayou bottomland. So heard those vocalizations, don't know it was a Bigfoot, but it was three o'clock in the morning in a desolate swamp. And it's either some unknown animal that we don't know about that makes those sounds or actually a Bigfoot or the Falk monster. No places on earth seem to hold more lore than those of swamps. They're hard to navigate, they harbor what are often unfairly deemed dangerous creatures, the sunlight has a hard time penetrating through the thick growth. Historically, they've harbored diseases like malaria and West Nile virus, and the wall of sound produced by the bugs and amphibians is just downright eerie. Add complete darkness to the mix, and you have yourself a recipe for terror. The swamps of southwest Arkansas are no exception. They're as alluring as they are haunting, and you can't help but think to yourself, what could be lurking in that vast expanse? Here, many claim that the Falk monster prowls these dense, sparsely populated river bottoms and bogs. Are the reports dating back to the early 1900s all figments of the residents' imaginations, or are they real encounters with a seven-foot-tall, 500-pound, flesh-and-blood creature? I'll leave that for you to decide. Well, I grew up in Cheyenne, Arapaho country. So a lot of my friends growing up, you know, and relatives would talk about Bigfoot, just like this is just a fact of life. Um, so I grew up not necessarily being skeptical, but not really believing at the same time. And it was actually a camp out with some friends where really early one morning, like right at dawn, I was instantly wide awake and I heard this series of whooping sounds, really loud. And I could, I sat up in bed and I know it's very, you know, kind of cliche to say I woke up and the hair was on the back of my neck, you know, cold chills, but that's exactly what it, it was like a instant, like I, I, like a fear reaction and I was immediately wide awake. And so I was like, 
I'm going to catch who's doing this because that had to have been a hoax. So I ran, you know, got up, ran out toward that direction, didn't see anyone. It was just barely dawn. So I sat there very quietly, kind of hidden, and I thought, I'm gonna just sit here and wait for whoever that was. And over the next, I don't know, half hour or so, everybody started coming out of their tents and everyone was accounted for. So when I got back home, I, I you know, got on the internet and I was listening to different, you know, Southeast Oklahoma bird sounds and mountain lions and everything I could possibly think of, nothing was close. And found out later, uh, Todd, who was there at the time, had set out a recorder overnight and he recorded what I heard. And so I got a copy of his recording and I emailed it to a friend who's a primatologist. Didn't tell her what it was, where it was from. I just said, what is this? And she emailed back and said, it's a gibbon. Okay, why is a gibbon in Southeast Oklahoma? Why did I hear a gibbon moving through the woods in southeast Oklahoma? So that was the moment where I'm like, I can't explain this. I heard it myself. It woke me up. I don't know what it is, but there's something that I don't know what is out there. And now I just have to know what it is. So it's like... All right, so we're back out here on the third and final night of the Aptitude Outdoors Squatching Adventure. And uh, we got a few more people with us tonight. A group of people came down from the Falk Monster Festival uh, and we're headed down this trail we found earlier at the boat ramp that we were calling last night. And a lot of these people have been doing this for a long time. So we'll see kind of what they do, what kind of calls they make, what kind of stuff we can stir up uh, it's been quite an adventure so far, and I'm really stoked that I uh, got to do this and interview some really great people. And, you know, whatever happens, I've had a blast. You know, I know a lot of people think Bigfoot's hokey and all this stuff, but I've, I've really had a good time. I've met a lot of great people out here. And, you know, if you ever get the opportunity, do it yourself because it's kind of freaky. It's kind of scary. It's also really fun. You get to really meet some awesome and great people. So let's go on the last night and see what we can get into. My son in law All right, so the group of people is back in the woods back here and they're just kind of sitting and chilling. So we're kind of gonna take a different approach and maybe head up this road a little bit, kind of in a different direction because I don't really know why. I don't really know what I'm doing, but there's some, some logic behind it maybe. I don't know, this third day, my brain's not functioning very well because I'm getting pretty tired, staying up late, getting up early, but uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take off down this road a little ways, separate ourselves from the main group of people that are over here. Uh, they might be doing some calls and stuff, so we're just gonna go look in a different direction, maybe see if we can see something that maybe everyone else isn't seeing. So let's go check it out. How long? Let her rip. that more often than not, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. As far as here, I'm not sure, but it depends on the place. Some places, like Monster Central, which used to be in Louisiana, and I thought they had up to 15 of them, I think it was at one point. Within. It depends. If, I mean, if you're the one hanging out in the area, you may get a response if it carries far enough. And, some of them, they move with the food, and others, uh, they're just 
stationary. I would think it, a lot of it depended on the food and cover. There's plenty of cover here. You would think there's plenty of food. There's amphibians everywhere and snakes and geez, I guess you get desperate enough you can eat an alligator. I'd eat an alligator. They taste pretty good. Yeah, I've spent so much time in the woods in the dark that like I wouldn't say I'm scared. It's creepy out here, but I don't know if it's because it's a swamp. It does I don't know. Good. Especially, uh, I don't know, something about the lure of swamps and mist and uh, I think it's the just the venomous stuff that could be out there. Yeah, there's like a mythology behind swamps though. <clears throat> it's just like an aura of creepiness, you know? That's awesome. Of course, I'd rather go swamp in the winter, but <laughs> yeah. you could see where nobody wants to go in them. Yeah. You have an unlimited supply of food at certain times of the year. A barrier of bugs and critters and biting everything. It just keeps people away. The average person's not going to want to go in. They had alternative currents. Holy shit. You would have. Oh, no, that was creepy. Yeah, boy, he was flying. Like kids. That was creepier than any Bigfoot stuff going on. Well. People are the most dangerous thing in the woods. <laughs> I'm just gonna call out and go do these things again. Just so they're not, just so they're not like, you know, they're messing with us. in July it was scorching hot and we decided to take the top off his Jeep and drive around you know the countryside there and we were looking for a smoother trail because the path we were on was just insanely rough and he took a left and as soon as he took a left he said what is that and I looked up only just to see bushes move on the left hand side of the road because I was trying to get my FLIR operational. He floorboarded it. We shot up there and just as soon as the vehicle came to a stop, we noticed an enormous tunnel in the brush, which was probably that high to me. And uh, I ran down it with the FLIR, you know, and focused and looking and there it was. And this animal was on all fours but it moved effortlessly and it was at about this angle. So I'm seeing hind quarters, but I can still see the movement and I can see it kind of try to twist around, but it twisted its entire body rather than look back over its shoulder. And I can hear footfalls and I know Jerry's coming down the trail right behind me and he bumped into me. And I said, I, I, Jerry, I can't see it now. And he goes, well, hold it still. And I said, well, you be still. So I brought it back into focus, handed it to him, and just as I handed it to him, he said, it just stood up. And he watched it as it proceeded back toward the east. And he handed it to me, he said, it's going to the road. He said, I'm gonna go up there and look at it. So I watched it and it had dropped back down on all fours. It circled back around. I could hear him going back up the path. And he said, good God. And I thought, I gotta get back up there because I've lost sight of it now. So by the time I get back up there, the animal has moved on. And Jerry said it was just eye to eye level. And I thought, well, you're what, 5'8"? That's hardly caused to say it's a giant, you know? The next day we went back down there and the road sloped. And at the approximate location where the animal was standing, for that animal to be eye to eye with Jerry was well over seven feet. And that's when it became real to me because I'd heard these stories my entire life living in Atoka County, 
surrounding areas where we have Oklahoma's Boggy Creek that I talked about in my presentation. So I was nonplussed by all the, the tales and the stories, but that's when it really hit home to me, like there is something to this. Takes, once you know these things are in the woods, it takes a whole other level yep. of camping in some of these spots by yourself. So when you're out here doing this, the power of suggestion is really strong. We're standing at the edge of the woods. Something walked, made a noise, get your heart going. I mean, likely it was a small animal, but uh, it definitely, uh, when you're standing out here in the middle of the night, trying to look for something that's, you know, eight foot tall, thousand pound mythical creature that definitely uh gets your brain stirring Sound like an owl for a second. For a second, it didn't sound like an owl. Something moving in there. Something moving behind me. Well, I, I thought I was looking Three or four steps right behind us. I thought it was right behind me, like right, right there. Like we heard earlier. I'm not jumping. Huh? Listen. It's a bug. No, no. It's a lot more open in here. Well, it appears we've hit the end of this road, you know, in big, bold, welded, no trespassing sign. When you're out here in the middle of the night, probably a smart rule to follow, but the woods have opened up significantly. It's just eerie out here. It's the best way to describe it. Lots of bird noises I don't not really familiar with either. Me too. Scared of the mosquitoes away. Those are wood knocks for sure. Yeah. I didn't think, what you think of wood knocks in my paradigm at that moment. Well, then the car came and it was like 20 seconds later. Yeah. What in the car? 
No. That's probably what would startled me. I mean, either that or it's a branch falling big from a tree. It didn't Later. crash. It was just a pop. It's true. Okay, so there's a levee back here at the boat access ramp that we've been kind of messing around at for the last few hours. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, haven't really heard anything all night. We've been wandering around, calling, listening, doing, you know, the thermal camera that I got here. And uh, it's been pretty uneventful. So I'm walking down to the river to walk up this levee. We haven't been up there yet. We're, we're considering going up there to see if we can see anything. Uh, the main group of people is still back where they were earlier. They're kind of like staying put and just looking around. We're kind of just roaming. And so I walk down there, walking, uh, got uh, a few people behind me. And uh, all of a sudden hear what sounds like a wood knock. Uh, obviously unverifiable. It just sounded like a tree branch hitting a tree. And uh, I turn around and look. And then within a 20, 30 seconds, this car comes barreling down the road, kind of like we caught on camera earlier. Um, so it's weird, you know, weird series of events. Is it coincidence that you hear this noise and this car comes barreling down the road? Or are they separate events? don't know it's late I'm tired <laughs> my brain's fried but it's like you know that's a quintessential element of what we all know as quote-unquote Bigfoot activity so out here in the dark in the middle of the night your brain's spinning and you're thinking could this be a Bigfoot or is my mind playing tricks on me so to be determined but uh I'm thinking we're probably going to start wrapping it up here soon. We got a lot of driving to do tomorrow, but uh, yeah, it's been one hell of an adventure and I'm really uh, glad I got to come out here and do this in the backwoods, Arkansas, East Texas. I hope I get to do it again someday. Over the years, a year I would believe, and next year I wouldn't believe, the next year I'd believe, and then every year and a half or two, something would happen that I'd say, oh my God, whatever's come up close to my camp share is real. This isn't fake. And just the evidence built and built and built until finally I'd had an encounter in the mountains of Oklahoma where one just went by my tent and growled at me and threw rocks at me and I could smell it and I knew it was real. And then my friend and I had a sighting not far from there a few years later. And once I saw one, I mean, there was no doubt about it. You know, since then, I've, I've had a lot more experiences where I've heard just really bizarre things that I can tell you what it's not, but I can't tell you what it is, so. So all of that together is the most convincing thing that I've experienced in one night that was like, okay, this is crazy. So that was, that was pretty, uh, pretty important, uh, at, at least in my career, in terms of you know, really experiencing something. I would rather prefer to stay within the boundaries of science and not use the term of belief, okay? Because belief invokes a leap of faith. But here was the physical evidence before me, right there. I could see this animal. I knew it wasn't a bear because we had photographed bears and bears only came to right here, you know, waist high. This thing almost chest high to me when we got down there. That's when I knew that there was something to these myths and legends that I had previously believed in, now I knew. Hey, I'm maybe the only guy I know of that's actually taken three pounds of feces through TSA only to find out I wasted my money. We pretty much ate ramen for the month. But uh, I tell you what, I never trade that story. Got the DNA proof that it was absolutely nothing that it, they could identify, but that's part of it. Uh, 10 years from now, I can tell that story and I, that's what I wouldn't trade for the Bigfoot experience. Ooh.